Having said that, I'd like to introduce Dave Hughes, uh, who will introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our speaker today is Bill Steele. When Bill was still quite a young man, he decided to adjust the trajectory of his life toward exploration. And since that time, Bill has spent a significant portion of his time, his effort, his money, and his passion in that direction. For example, Bill was an important member of the very first team that did the initial descent of Incredible Pit in Ellison's Cave System, Georgia. At 440 feet of free fall rappel, Incredible was at that time the second biggest drop known in the United States. During an intense summer in the 1970s, Bill spent a significant portion of time in the silver tip system in Montana, bashing away, endeavoring to try to set a US depth record. A courageous effort, albeit unsuccessful in breaking that record. But most of you in this audience today know Bill from his work in Mexico, and in particular in the Watla system. Indeed, Bill has written a highly personal account that is perhaps the definitive book on Watla summarizing 30 years of his own experience in that system. And in Bill's book, he persuasively argues that although Watla is not the deepest cave in the world, it is very likely the greatest deep cave on the planet. Bill has received many honors for his exploration efforts. Let me name simply two. Bill is a recipient of the National Speleological Society's Lubicking Award, and Bill is also a fellow emeritus of the prestigious Explorers Club. Please join me in welcoming your 2015 NSS luminary, Mr. Bill Steele. Thank you, Dave. What an honor to be asked to do this. You can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. <laughs> Summer 1953, one of my earliest memories, maybe my earliest memory, is of my first cave on our first family vacation. That's Fairyland Caverns, Rock City, above Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I actually have a vivid recollection of that because I liked it so much. I remarked to my parents that it just was so different, that it was a different world. You walked through that portal and everything was different. It seemed so inviting. And from then on, family lore has it, that I never let it go. That any time we were on family vacation and I saw a cave, I wanted to go there. Yep, I read Cave Carson comics. <laughs> in fact, the first time I saw the, world, well, the word speleologist was in Cave Carson comics. And I did find anything I could about caves and read it after I learned to read, and didn't know, though, about the body of literature until later. When I was a Boy Scout, I was in a super good Boy Scout troop in a suburb of Dayton, Ohio, and uh, we went to two weeks of summer camp every year, one week to scout camp where we worked on merit badges, and one week of what we called adventure camp. And I suggested we go caving. And the scoutmaster thought that was a great idea, but then I got an assignment, and that was to find an expert and uh, read up on it. So I went to the Dayton Public Library, and there were a lot of books there. Little did I know that Roger Brucker lived there, and, and other, uh, that others that were very active at CRF at Mammoth Cave in Flint Ridge. So I was fortunate that uh, there was a body of literature. Here's something else to point out. I was going to go to the NSS convention the following summer in Bloomington, Indiana. That was my first one in 1965, 50 years ago. And going to that convention convinced me I wanted to go to college there. Like I told my dad, there are a lot of good universities, but that one's got a caving club. <laughs> and I think that's when he said, son, you got caves on the brain. Which I said, thank you, too. 
I was a carbide caver for 30 years, and I love talking carbide. I like uh, all those tricks of keeping them working, and I've peed in them, and I've uh, run out of water, and I've big water off people, and I even was remarking last night that I, I got used to being dehydrated while caving because I would always save my drinking water for my carbide lamp. But I haven't used one, I don't think, in 20 years. And I've got a scurry on, in fact, now, and I love it. But I still got carbide lamps on the mantle, and I've been acquiring carbide from other Texas cavers here lately, just so I uh, will never run out of it. I think there are a lot of people in the room that know that place. I tracked down a picture on the internet and found it on Doug Love's mother's website. That's Blinz's barn outside of Bloomington. And I went caving there for 10 years, from the mid-60s to the mid-70s. I had a vivid recollection of, of uh, George Corey, Sarah Corey's husband, repelling from that uh, upper window, uh, sitting on a wine bottle neck with a rope wrapped around the body. And I thought that was a pretty cute trick, but I didn't do it. <laughs> this is Blue Springs Cave which is one of my favorites in the days. And I think the visitor center for Blue Springs Cave is right around where those 60s vintage cars are parked. This picture was taken around 1968. And we used to rent canoes and uh, take them uh, down the stream there, the river in Blue Springs Cave, and, and then uh, go off and explore in that cave. Saw an awful lot of it. And uh, learned about getting cold and being wet. I wanted to do vertical caving pretty much after the NSS News in, I think it was March of 1968, that had that fantastic picture of, uh, of cavers in Golandrinus. And I said, oh, okay, that's what I want to do, deep caves. And this is uh, one of my first pits. This is a pit in Indiana, and that's me on gold line. And uh, I think I probably used Prusik knots to climb out. I got injured. I've been rescued out of a cave one time. I was 19 years old and I fractured my skull in gory hole, deepest pit in Indiana. And that's me in the infirmary at Indiana University holding up the uh, Bedford Daily Times newspaper uh, with an article about me, IU student rescued from a cave. Ruined my day. Started going to TAG in the uh, late 60s and just kept after it. And I don't know how many trips I've taken to tag, but quite a few, still go. Planning on a couple more before this year's out. Um, that's the old tag house, which was near Ingle Double Cave, uh, near the Paint Rock Valley, and uh, became close friends with many of the tag cavers, and met, went there a lot of times, and kind of missed that scene, though I hear there's another tag house now over toward Russell Cave. And Andy Zellner keeps rented. Did a surprise pit uh, in uh, late 68, and it was there that I met a guy who then became one of my best friends for the next 20 some years, and that was Richard Schreiber. And Richard Schreiber um, happened to be at Surprise Pit the day we went. If you don't know, that was the deepest cave in the United, or deepest pit in the United States until Richard found Fantastic Pit in Ellison's cave. Uh, around that time, October 68, he found that and uh, invited me to come there. And this is a fantastic pit. And my friends and I from Bloomington uh, joined Richard there in very early 69. And then, uh, as Dave said in the introduction, we're on the first ascent of the of incredible pit. And this is that day. This photo uh, does not include Marion Smith because he took the photo. And that was the, the day I met Marion, which I believe was, um, uh, he can correct me on this, he's the historian, March the 29th, I think, 1969, but he could correct me. Pardon me? Early May. Early May. See? Thank you. Uh, that's Schreiber in the, on the left. Uh, sadly, he died in 1990, but he was the first recipient to the Lou Bicking Award and a uh, dear friend of mine for the next 22 years after I met him in 68. Um, I, w I did a lot of caving with the people in the picture there. Um, Della McGuffin's in the middle, and I just heard last night that she lives in Alaska now. I've lost touch with her, but the other cavers there I've seen in the last few years and still friends of mine. Incredible. This is incredible pit, 440 foot free fall, and uh, haven't done it in many years, but I was on the first crossover trip, which is that following summer, and 
meaning going in one side of the mountain and coming out the other and passing the other team in the middle. And uh, during one of those trips, I think it was the first crossover trip of Ellison's, I met the uh, McMaster's University cavers from Hamilton, Ontario, who had just gone to Woutla. And that was where I first heard about it, was uh, that summer, and decided uh, that was someplace I wanted to go eventually. Um, Schreiber and, and Della McGuffin camped in, in Lower Ellison's for a week, and uh, my friends and I from Bloomington were the first to see the North Pole and other parts of Lower Cave Ellison's uh, that Richard and Della had found the week before as they camped in there. Switching to Kentucky, this is the uh, tombstone of Stephen Bishop, and I love going to CRF. I love cave in there at Hamilton Valley. I'm planning on going Labor Day, it's coming up soon. One thing I like about it is, is the great history of cave exploration. There is the longest cave in the world and it's been explored for over 200 years. And there's places back in there that you can see Stephen's Bishop, Stephen Bishop's signature to this day. And of course, Floyd Collins. When I was caving there in the late 60s and through the 70s, he was still buried or, or in this casket within uh, Floyd Collins' crystal, crystal Cave and was moved out later on and given a proper burial um, on Flint Ridge. And I've been on business trips. This picture was taken when I was on a business trip to Kentucky a few years ago, a bunch of years ago, I guess. And uh, I've gone by there and just kind of talked to Floyd, you know, one cave explorer to another with nobody else around. And nothing wrong with that. And if he can sense it, I'm sure he appreciates it. But that does say greatest cave explorer ever known. <laughs> and there's uh, one of my daddies, <laughs> Roger, Roger Brucker, who happened to have signed my application to join the NSS back in the day when you had to get a signature. And uh, given how he likes to tease people, I recall being teased about it too, you know. Were we worthy? And we'd driven all the way over to Yellow Springs, Ohio, which wasn't that far, to uh, talk to him about that. But this is the dormitory area of Hamilton Valley. And if you've never gone caving there, it's just pure joy to go caving in the longest cave in the world and have the facilities so uh, well organized. Mexico. Started going there, and uh, my first trip was in 1970. So it's only been 45 years ago, and there's plenty of people in the room that been there a lot more than me but I've done a lot and uh, the stuff that I'm most proud of is the state of Oaxaca down here I wrote a book about a cave in Chiapas Yochib the river cave that's a, a very challenging cave down here close to Guatemalan border caves in Guerrero San Luis Tamaulipas Nuevo Leon so on love the country this is uh, me in 1970 at the edge of uh, Wismotitla, which is in the Tamaya Valley, and that's about a 400 foot drop. And I could stand here and tell you hard lessons learned throughout all my caving, because I guess I learned the hard way about things. For instance, this day was the day I recall learning that you don't want to repel with a heavy rope over your shoulder, <laughs> because it becomes difficult to not flip upside down. And that's a 400 foot drop, and I got a 300 foot rope over my shoulder which I regretted very soon after this picture was taken. <laughs> Learning stuff the hard way. Of course it went to Golandrinas, and uh, Marion Smith was on my first trip there. I've been down it uh, three times, and been down the crevice at the bottom a couple of times. Still love it. Um, greatest entrance in the world, in my opinion. And uh, just one of those special places on this planet. But in 1971, I was still a student at Indiana University, and a friend of mine named Skip Roy inherited some money and talked me into dropping out of college and going to Mexico for six months. And that's when my parents and I had a misunderstanding, let's say. <laughs> And I think my dad might have said something like, well, you know he's got caves in the brain, whatever. It'll probably work out. So we did, and we didn't know exactly what our objective was. We just wanted to find a major cave to work on. And um, we went to one that the AMCS, the Association of Mexican Cave Studies, 
already knew about and in fact there had been a Life magazine article about because in the late 50s, I'm sorry, in the late 60s they determined that the oldest known cave paintings in the Americas was in this cave, Grutas de Huxlawaca in the state of Guerrero which is north of uh, Acapulco in that same state and it's fascinating, that's a human skull uh, coated with calcite and then there's a, a painting well over a mile in the cave of a uh, most likely a priest dressed in a jaguar skin right at the entryway to a large room where 3,000 years ago they cleared the floor of big rocks and carved a throne in the, in the flowstone on the far side of the room and it's just a fascinating place. I've been back there in recent years and uh, now it's a national park and uh, they have tour buses there and a visitor center there and it's so interesting to go back many years later and see the changes because there was a, a barely worn footpath when we went there in 1971 and spent three months there thoroughly exploring it and mapping it. The Chug House. This is southern Indiana. In 70 or 71, um, a couple of us went to see a local newspaper publisher in Corydon, Indiana and asked him about an old house he had there at the edge of the Harrison Crawford State Forest which is right in the center where we were working on some caves and we said uh, we'd like to use that as a field house and uh, explore these caves and map them and he allowed us and we had the Chug House which stood for a uh, Crawford Harrison underground group our gang sometimes people said and uh, that man, that newspaper publisher, later on became the governor of the state, um, Frank O'Bannon. In fact, this became his retreat while he was governor of Indiana. And I contacted his office when I was going to Bloomington on a business trip about 12 years ago, something like that, and asked if I could stay in the Chug House. And uh, his security people said, absolutely not. But I got to walk around and look at it again after so many years. Um, right up the hill from the Chug House and right outside the State Forest is uh, a cave I worked hard on and it's a very hard cave. And I learned a lot of lessons in this cave and I learned how to rig and I learned some techniques for going through particularly tight places and keeping a cool head. This is the entrance to Parker's Pit which at the time we explored to the point where it was the deepest cave in Indiana. And there's one tight obstacle after another one. This one's named the Upper Bound. And you're on rappel and having to squeeze through chest tight places. And I've told people that uh, I'm not a claustrophobic. On the contrary, I'm a claustromanic, which is the opposite of claustrophobia. I actually seek out tight confined places because it's like being embraced and loved by Mother Earth herself. And a true claustrophobic, you can see squirming when I say that. And I can't see anybody squirming. Not in this group. We did a 75-foot Tyrolean Traverse in the back of, uh, of um, Parker's, which uh, then I think within a year of this picture taken, we did in Yochib in southern Mexico to avoid a gigantic waterfall. We're just in the, in the air above it. So I was uh, learning techniques that then I went on to apply in deep caves in Mexico. I got involved with NSS conventions. I think I've been on staff for four of them. 73, 78, 94, and then the International in Texas in 2009. This was the first one, and uh, this was the Howdy Party at the Bloomington uh, Convention in 1973. I was 24 years old, and I was chairman of the Howdy Party, and I was proud of that. I think that it was years before what, what success that was that night was surpassed. Um, main thing was we got everybody drunk. Is all the beer you could drink. And we lied to everybody and said uh, the barbecued pork was possum that we've been picking up for a, kill for, for a year. And I don't know if anybody was there remembers this. Sam Frushauer certainly does because he was an accomplice. But we had uh, a box of 50 cigars sitting at the end of the food line, eight of which were loaded with ladyfinger firecrackers. <laughs> and that was the entertainment for the staff. Because you'd be... Working hard, and in the distance you'd hear an explosion. And then somebody would come, find you, and say, I threw my dinner in the air. And you'd say, well, you're fine to have another one and uh, have another cigar, too. 
<laughs> Summer of 74, I contacted friends in Austin. Um, been hanging out with Austin Cavers, had good friends, Terry Raines, Gail Hediger, Blake Harrison, and others, and wondered if there was anything happening in Mexico that summer, and they said, nah, we're all going to Montana. So I hitchhiked to Denver, and uh, they picked me up, and we went to Silvertip. We hired uh, packers, and they packed us in, and once I saw that mountain, which I think is one of the most beautiful mountains in the world, and it does have seven or eight miles of cave in it, I was hooked for the next few years. And that also delayed me starting a career for the next few years. Was to be free to go there in the summers. And one summer I spent more than eight weeks up there. Became a real mountain man. Found it strange to drive again when I got back down to my car. Really had some good times. This is an Art Palmer shot of Peggy rappelling down the 80 foot, uh, 85 foot pits, what we named it, in part of uh, Silver Tip Cave System. And Gary Schindel and I were talking a few minutes ago that his son's on his way there right now. And they're going to remap the Silver Tip Cave System and uh, finish up some leads that uh, I still recall and never got back to. But I went up there about seven or eight summers in a row and uh, explored a major cave system in the Northern Rockies. Also almost died. The picture, this picture uh, was taken the next day after I went in on about a 24-hour trip and that's when I got marooned on the side of a drop and kind of learned a lesson about being a bit too bold because I was a, a little cocky and I was climbing things without ropes and uh, getting by with it until I didn't. And uh, I wrote an article about that which uh, is titled, uh, It Became an Obsession. And just in the last year or so, I've learned that uh, it's sort of a cult classic among uh, young expeditionary cavers that they pass that on to each other, which I'm proud of because they weren't born when I wrote it. It's kind of neat. Blood Cave is up there in Silvertip Mountain. And uh, hopefully when the convention happens in the near future in Montana, uh, many of you will be able to do the backpack trip into the Bob Marshall Wilderness and see this uh, wonderfully beautiful cave, Blood Cave. Mexico, spring of 1976, there was uh, excitement in the air because a new deep cave had been found uh, named uh, Conchas in an area where the locals had really never seen anybody from the inside, uh, I mean from the outside the area, and uh, a lot of people showed up. Gil, I think this is a picture you took. There's a shot that you took and one that Bob West took of the same, essentially the same group. But this was a lot of people sitting around the entrance there. And uh, we, we bottomed this thing about 500 meters deep. Um, in fact, it's a little embarrassing because uh, Bill Stone and uh, Steve Ward and I actually reached the bottom uh, the day before most of these people arrived. And we just meant to rig it. We didn't mean for it to end. So you know how that goes. Yochib, southern Mexico. When I first heard of this cave, Canadians had been there already, and there were some who said it was impossible to explore. Reason was, is because it's got wall-to-wall -wall deep water with a fast current. Now I'll tell you, you've got to go slow, because you're not going to stay alive if you let that current have you, because there's a waterfall downstream, kind of like being above Niagara Falls. But we proved them wrong. It was explorable. Uh, it's just that you had to go slowly. And uh, there's a guy in this photo that recently passed away, Michael Boone, who's uh, kind of a legend. He was already in, a legend in Great Britain as the father of cave diving in uh, England. And uh, one thing that, that I've liked to do throughout my caving career because I take exploration seriously, is uh, seek out people that I hear are really good at it and see what that means and learn from them. Um, Stan Sides two days ago as a luminary talked about John Wilcox. Uh, first time I went to Flint Ridge and I stood in line to be assigned a trip to go on. They said, what kind of trip are you looking for? And I said, I don't care where I go as long as it's long and hard. And the guy smiled and said, go with John Wilcox. You'll get that. And I think what I learned from Wilcox, like any other really good cavers I've gone caving with, is attitude as much as anything. 
And I remember I was in a, a miserable spot with Wilcox, and I said, Jesus is just miserable. And he smiled and he said, where are you going to be Monday? And I said, well, back home and at school. And he goes, then it's not so bad, is it? <laughs> and it wasn't. <laughs> Blake Harrison's in the room, and this is Blake in this shot. Norm Pace took this picture. Um, we thought we lost Norm Pace in this cave. Seriously thought he'd drown, but then he appeared. He came back. And uh, it was a very dangerous cave with that fast water, and it did flood while we were in it. And uh, I'm a survivor of that, obviously, and Blake is, and Gary Knapper's in the room. He was in on that incident, and our lives were saved by Michael Boone. He did a hero move and swam in the current like Johnny Weissmuller. And uh, so I felt compelled to go to his memorial service back in May and even spoke there. It was on the banks of a river north of uh, Jasper, Alberta. It was a wonderful event. Very, very moving. Wrote a book about that, Yo Cheeb the River Cave. If you haven't read it, please read it. I don't care if you buy it, just read it. Moved to Kirkwood. I packed up and left Indiana in 1976. Probably should have gone sooner. Stayed in Indiana because of a woman. You know how that is. <laughs> this is Bill Stone's truck. He lived down the street. I think when I lived there in uh, 76 and 77, there were eight caver houses in a block and a half stretch. One day I was walking down the street there, longish hair, I guess, you know, Austin, Texas, late 70s, and there was a guy walking down the street with a pinstripe suit on and wingtip shoes. He looked out of place, and he was looking at houses, and I said, can I help you? And he said, I'm looking for the pit hippies. And I said, well, I guess I'd be one. He was looking for his daughter. He'd come to fetch her from the pit hippies. <laughs> There's people in the room, room know who I'm talking about. <laughs> First time I went to Watlow was in uh, May of 77. And uh, it had already been determined by Bill Stone and Frank Benny and Jim Smith that uh, where the Canadians had reached in 1968 was not the end of the cave. And uh, thank goodness they had published a map with a question mark on it at a depth of 500 meters. And there was a trip at Christmas of 76 to just go check that question mark. Well, the cave was about 2,000 feet deep at that time and about 3,000, I'm sorry, about three miles long. Now it's 5,000 feet deep and 45 miles long. So thank, thank goodness people use question marks because it can mean there's a lot of cave beyond. This is the road up to Woutla. Um, the last 40 kilometers is like this. It's paved now. But in the old days, it could take six hours to drive that last 40 kilometers all the way up there. This is uh, one of the, the deeper drops in uh, the system. At present, there's 20 entrances, 600 pits in that cave that we've rigged. And it's 72 kilometers long, about 45 miles. I gave a presentation yesterday on this year's expedition. I was there for six weeks with 47 people total and no more than 24 people at a time. And it's the real thing. It's what I dreamed of doing when I was a kid. Expeditions. When I read the books about the caves of the Pyrenees or others in France and wanted to live like that. Well, I have. And I uh, got to do a bunch of it. This is Jim Smith's wonderful picture of Anthodite Hall, which to me is like a gigantic temple. It's one of the most wonderful places on earth I've ever been. I enjoy showing this picture to school age children sometimes and ask them, how many people in this picture? What's the answer? One. Wrong. Three. <laughs> person on the right, person in the middle, person on the left. Then I like to ask them, well, how many people were in the room? Four, a guy that took the picture. <laughs> That's me many years ago, 1980, pushing the first thousand meter deep cave in the western hemisphere. This picture was taken in Lini Ta. We did it in wetsuits. We uh, made an extraordinary uh, biological collection of uh, the first troglobitic scorpion ever discovered. 
And I brought it back in a bottle full of isopropyl alcohol and asked James Riddell in Texas, who should I send this to? And he said, uh, Oscar Franke, the expert on scorpions in the United States. He was at Texas Tech at the time. I sent it to him and he got all excited and said, well, please find a mature male. You've sent me a mature female. And I said, we've seen one. <laughs> then I asked him, are they poisonous? And he said, don't know how poisonous. If anybody gets stung, keep notes. <laughs> and we collected a mature uh, male the next year and he wrote a paper and now we've discovered even more. I think we found a new species last year. And Oscar Franke nowadays is coming on our expeditions to Wautla and bringing graduate students with him. Uh, camping underground, we've done a lot of that in Wautla. The longest I personally have ever stayed in a cave without coming out is 13 days. Others have uh, camped longer amounts of time in the Watla Caves, uh, but that's just the way it's worked out for me, and that was actually long enough. Uh, one thing I discovered long ago is if you get a cut, it doesn't heal when you're underground. And one time in one of these deep Watla camps, I lacerated my right arm on the way in, and uh, I just had to sort of nurse the, that wound for, for days to keep infection from setting in. But once I got out to the sunlight, it healed. Uh, this is Camp 2, and uh, we called it Mazateca Shores. It was convenient because water ran right by camp, but there was only enough room in the floor for the community kitchen, and Dino Lowry and Steve Zeman to sleep here, and I was in that hammock right there. And it's interesting to me that we're probably going to reactivate this camp next year, next year's expedition, because we're working in this cave again. Um, this is about 500 meters deep in uh, the Lagrieta section of of uh, Sistema Wautla. Ernie Garza and uh, Blaine Colton and my ex-wife Janet and I went down there in 1979 to Wautla for just, uh, I think it was a week we were there, just to do recon. And we hired an airplane in uh, Tehuacan, Puebla, and uh, flew out over the Serra Bon and spotted these gigantic entrances, which I don't think have been reached yet. Ernie can correct me, but I don't think so. The, the right one has, okay. But uh, a few years later, some Swiss cavers asked us if there was an area that they could work. And we said, well, we've been meaning to go up there on the Cerro Rabon Plateau to the east, but uh, we're busy here in Wautla. Why don't you guys go on up there? And they found the Kiai, which is a thousand meter deep cave that I later on went to with them and camped underground a thousand meters deep in that cave. And there's still a lot up there to do. And Ernie Garza is the, the secret to that because he knows people and he knows the way up. And nobody's working it right now. In 1980, in Wautla, the Cold War came to caving. And this is a group of Polish cavers. They were still communist. And these guys were professional sportsmen with military ranks. And one of them had just been to Everest, climbed Everest for the motherland. And uh, then his next assignment, his next mission was to go beat the Americans in the deep cave in Mexico. And the cave god spoke and they had bad accidents and we came to the rescue. And um, it's all in my book about it. This picture was taken around, I would say, March 25th, 1980. And the reason I know that is, is because there's a date burned into my memory, and that's uh, March the 29th, 1980. March the 29th, 1980 was the day that we reached 1,000 meters in depth, which is a big deal to us, because in deep caving, 1,000 meters in depth is like 8,000 meters in elevation for the tallest mountains in the world. When we reached 1,000 meters in depth in the cave right behind us, this picture, which Ernie and Blaine and Janet and I had found three months before um, in our reconnaissance trip, we quickly reached 1,000 meters of depth in that cave, Linita, and um, it was the seventh cave in the world, 1,000 meters deep, first one outside of Europe, and this spring I checked Bob Goulden's site for the deepest caves in the world, and, and now there's over 105 uh, thousand meter deep caves in the world. So that just really um, 
uh, speaks to the pace of exploration through the last 35 years since we did that in that cave. <laughs> this is a local boy that uh, hung around with us a lot and he was particularly bright and um, we'd bring him books and he, uh, he was just the mascot. He'd hang around our field house there in Woutla and we got to spend some time with him this year. We like to think that we influenced him because now he's a physician. He, uh, he, he was born in an Indian family, Mazatec Indian family. His, his father still was barefoot in the corn this spring. Who, he's got to be in his late 70s. And his son, Isaias now, very well-educated man. And uh, he told us that he's just now beginning to get serious about learning English. And he's doing it by listening to country music. <laughs> I said, really? What country music? And he handed me some CDs and he had some... Uh, he had some Johnny Cash and, uh, you know, that, that kind of country music. So I said, you're going to learn a lot of heartache. And he said, see. <laughs> Found some interesting archaeology. This is uh, Blade Cave. And I believe Frank Bogle from Knoxville, Tennessee is in the room. And Frank told me again last night that the greatest discovery he's ever made in a cave was when he was the first one to see these artifacts after they'd sat still in this cave for 2,000 years. And my ex-wife Janet wrote her master's thesis on uh, the contents of this cave. We went to the archaeological officials in Oaxaca and the right thing was done with the artifacts and we made friends with them because we'd done the right thing and went to them and reported the, uh, the discovery. And uh, it's just really interesting to go in a cave that nobody's been in in 2,000 years and see things like footprints in the floor and uh, charcoal where they had a torch. I went to work for the Boy Scouts of America in 1980, uh, professional service. I ended a long and I'll say successful career with them last fall. Last 13 years of my career was national staff uh, at the highest level. Um, but when I first started, they were going to write a new hand, I mean field book. Field book is the book of outdoor techniques. And I was brand new as a professional with them and I was introduced to the guy from the national staff who was heading up this project and he heard I was a caver and I could just tell by the way he asked me if I was a caver, he had his doubts that I knew what I was talking about. And uh, I told him, well I was just on a three month expedition to the deepest cave in the western hemisphere and that was pretty much enough that he invited me to co-author with a guy named Jack Hissong, who I'm sure many of you in the room know, uh, a chapter about caving in the Boy Scouts America field book. Jack uh, uh, used to come to conventions, he's deceased now, and he had taken a lot of scouts caving, knew about that. And one thing I've always said I like about having written for the field book was, how often do you get to be on a facing page with Mark Twain? Uh, I was on the cover of the NSS News in 1987 uh, when uh, we had a major discovery in Sistema Wautla, found a new deep route. Uh, it was for a time tied with the second deepest cave in the world. Uh, it's now the eighth deepest cave in the world. A lot more has been found. Uh, this particular spot, you can see I'm rigged into a traverse line, is where uh, one of the Polish cavers fell and broke his leg. Uh, which then caused uh, the big rescue of two cavers that they had injured in the cave at the same time, a few years before this was taken. You can see the wheat lamp battery there on my side. 94 expedition, Bill Stone, Barbara Amendi, Indy, and uh, Monty Polson wrote a book entitled uh, Beyond the Deep is for sale here about this expedition. This is my front yard in San Antonio, Texas. That's my Cocker Spaniel right there. Um, this is the incident that uh, caused me to have problems with my next door neighbor. Because <laughs> I lived on a cul-de-sac. And he didn't care about this expedition or the high significance of it as I told him. We were blocking his driveway. I sent him a copy of the book. <laughs> oh, there it is. Beyond the Deep. Now, I tease Bill Stone a little bit about this, because I can. I've known the guy for 40 years, and, uh, you know, we've done a lot together, and I hear from him every few days. Um, I wanted to know when he figured out that it was the world's most treacherous cave, because that's the kind of thing you should tell your friends, because I've been going in there thinking it was kind of friendly. 
good grief. And as you know, Bill, you know how he would react to that. He sort of hangs his head and says, give me a break. The publisher did that. But I don't let up. I still tease him about that. Texas. I've lived in Texas since 1976, except for five years when, I, when my job took me to Oklahoma, and I happened to be there the five years we explored the longest cave in Oklahoma, Duncan Field Cave. But the cave that I like the most, I guess, in Texas is the longest cave in Texas, Honey Creek Cave. Many in the room have been there. It's 20, over 20 miles long. This is where the natural entrances are. There's two of them. They're just 100 feet or so apart. This is at high water, which it probably is right now because we've been having flooding in Texas. We're still working on this cave. In fact, coming up soon, September 12th to be exact, is the first weekend of a revived project to address the 152 remaining leads in this cave. And um, there's a long way back in the cave, many hours to get to. So it's going to be a labor of love for the next few years to uh, acquaint a lot of new cavers to, with that cave and, uh, and mop up the survey. Most of that cave is swimming in deep water. So you think Texas, you think the water is warm in the caves. It's not that warm. It's uh, about 70, 71 degrees Fahrenheit and it'll chill you pretty fast. So we wear thick wetsuits and uh, that's me in the 80s. I think Mike Futrell took this picture when I took him in the cave in the 80s. And you can see I got fins on there because there's some long swims. And in fact, that was a big challenge, was to do a swim that would take you over three hours on the way in, and then many hours later on the way out, do that same swim. And we were having problems with thigh cramps and so on. I was carrying a whole Nalgene bottle full of banana chips to keep my potassium level up and uh, not get thigh cramps. Uh, I still got those whisk detergent bottles for uh, flotation. They're great, because if you come across something floating there, you can open the cap and put it inside. The tributaries aren't deep water. You can uh, wade up them, and over the last few years, we've been having tank hauls to uh, an upstream sump, and we've having, been having good turnouts of cavers, many, sometimes as many as 50, and uh, they go on a long, hard trip to haul a scuba tank way upstream, at least three hours of travel, sometimes four, sometimes five. Uh, and there's people here in the room that have done that trip. But it's really been going well and uh, been a couple of very interesting videos shot of doing that. In 85, we decided, and the rancher wanted us to do it, we wanted to get another entrance put in. So I had an old friend in Indiana named Frank Reed. God rest his soul. He died a few years ago. In fact, died in a cave, as I recall. In James Cave, I think, in Kentucky. But Frank was an uh, electronics... Uh, an electrical engineer and he had a, had a cave radio and he drove down to Texas with it and we found a location about three miles back in the cave where we put a shaft entrance in and we've been using that ever since with a tractor that lowers three cavers at a time down a 145 foot shaft. I did a Carroll Cave shaft uh, Sunday and uh, really reminded me a lot of, of the Honey Creek shaft. This is at the bottom of it looking up. Cheve. This is uh, Sack Newson's well, deep in uh, Cheve, which is the other very deep cave on the other side of the Santo Domingo River from uh, Wautla in the state of Oaxaca in southern Mexico. Bill Stone took this shot. That's me hanging on rope in uh, a drop that's almost 200 meters deep. Well, it was named already before I went there, and it was named Sack Newson's well. And I'd read, I'd read uh, Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth when I was still in high school and I said you know it better be good if you're going to name it Sack Newson's well well it's good <laughs> it, it's a deserving name very very interesting uh, Cheve's uh, not only the second deepest cave in the world and only 70 I guess 70 meters shy of the depth of Sistema Wautla and it was even deeper than Wautla until two years ago when the Brits did their big expedition and did a deep dive at the bottom of Wautla but what's really interesting about Chevy is that Jim Smith, who may be in the room, he did a dye trace that shows that the cave with the most potential to be the deepest cave in the world is this one. He's got a 2,500 meter deep dye trace there. And the cave's only 
just shy of 1,500 meters deep. So there's a thousand meters more of potential here. And Bill Stone's organized an expedition to go back there in, uh, in two years to uh, look for that continuing way on. You know, the Emily Davis Mobley Rescue, Emily Davis now, uh, who's here at the convention. Um, I was in on the rescue of her in 1991. And uh, this is me when I got, I guess I was going. Uh, the National Park Service in uh, Carlsbad had uh, called and said, uh, pull together a team real quick and uh, we'll, we'll send a couple of planes over there and get you. So we went over there and, and spent uh, more than 24 hours in the cave rigging ropes to uh, get her on out of the cave, thankfully safely. Uh, it's interesting the requests you get when... Uh, people find out you're a caver. When I worked for the Boy Scout Council in San Antonio, I knew a guy that was a district judge and he told the mayor of San Antonio that he had a friend that had a rope long enough and the expertise uh, down to rappel off of the Tower of the Americas, which is a 600 foot free fall from the uh, edge of the roof up there. And why did they want somebody to do this? Because the mayor was chairman of a youth activity fair, and I guess he realized that nothing to get people out like thinking somebody may die. <laughs> and, uh, and we didn't. Mark Benton uh, is here, I'm sure, and a uh, dear friend of mine, done many years of caving with him, and we were discussing at lunch the other day how many trips we might have taken into Honey Creek together, and it's got to be 150 because we know we went in there one weekend and a month for 14 years, I think is what Mark figured out. And uh, here we, here's Mark around the campfire up in the uh, uh, Proyecto uh, Purificacion area of Tamaulipas, Mexico, when we uh, started a project a few years ago to uh, try to find higher entrances to that system. I organized a group and we carried the Explorers Club flag uh, in 2009 to uh, drop the thousand or so pits that are on top of Mesa Juarez uh, upslope from Purificacion. And that, that cave could be much deeper than it is now. It's 985 meters, I think, in depth, and it could be as much as uh, 14 or 1500 meters in depth. But uh, because of the situation in that part of Mexico, we haven't been going back because it's kind of scary in that particular part. Another part that's kind of scary is Guerrero. Uh, I did that caving there at Huslahuaca with the cave paintings back in the early 70s and started a, a project to explore a big cave named Borrego, which is west of uh, Chilpancingo in uh, Guerrero. But then we saw poppies uh, growing there and decided um, maybe we should go elsewhere. Uh, but this is uh, right behind these two cavers over here is a big room. We have not found the other side of it yet. Well, that's because the floor is all broken. You can't just walk across the floor. And I didn't have my scurry on yet. <laughs> this is uh, Santa Muerte. That's uh, kind of the, 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 the god and the religion of the cartels in Mexico. And the uh, first time I saw this, I stopped and said, what the heck? is this. So I know a lot more about it now. And in fact, the government in Mexico has been tearing these down and uh, not allowing this. And they're really cracking down. But in some places in Mexico, it is still kind of scary to go to. And uh, cavers haven't. Six years ago, uh, this book was published by Cave Books, my second book that's been published by Cave Books. Thank you to them. And uh, as Dave said in the introduction, this is my story. This is about my trips to Wildla. Um, I'll probably write another one when the project ends uh, in, in a few years. But uh, this just uh, grabbed on to 30 years between 2000, and, I mean 1977 and 2007. Uh, I was really proud to have been invited to write a chapter for this book, Adventurous Dreams, Adventurous Lives, um, by Jason Scovener, who's a member of the Explorers Club, lives in Canada. And uh, he contacted me and said, we want you to be one of 120 explorers and adventurers to tell about your aha moment. And I said, I know what I think aha moment means. Tell me w what it means to you. And he said, you know, when that moment happened, when you realize you love something so much, you're never going to quit doing it. And I said, oh, I remember. It was the first virgin cave I ever found when I was 13 years old. Never forget that. It's thrilling. Okay, so I wrote a chapter about that, and I'm 
in that book with the likes of uh, Chris Bonington, the British uh, mountaineer, and the Leakeys, and so forth. A couple of cavers too, Sam Meacham and uh, Jim Chester wrote chapters also for that. And then Will White invited Jim Smith and I to co-author a, a chapter for uh, Encyclopedia of Caves. This is the cover of second edition. We got a chapter into both editions, first and second, about Sistema Wautla and about addressing the disciplines of speleology. So we're not just exploring the cave and mapping it, but we mean to have papers published in the various disciplines, biology, archaeology, paleontology, and so on. And uh, we've been pretty good at that and uh, we're going to continue. And in fact, we're looking for a graduate student wanting to carry on with the geology. If uh, anybody knows of somebody that would like to talk to us, we've got more geology to study there. Jim Smith wrote his master's thesis on the geology of uh, Sistema Wautla for a master's degree at Western Kentucky. There's more to be done. So we'll talk to you. This 2009 um, ICSC, International uh, Congress of Speleology was held in Texas in Kerrville and I was again in charge of the Howdy Party. So I got the world uh, champion rope trick artist to come and they stood there on his horse in the middle of everybody and you can see me back here with the country uh, singer Dusty Bridges is his name. And uh, I dressed sort of outlandishly that night <laughs> because I was the MC and I wanted to be, you know, identified as the MC with my uh, flame tights and my lizard skin boots. And um, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I will. Um, I never had my ass pinched as many times in my life as when I had those tights on. <laughs> and what I said when a woman did this was, you want to feel buns of steel? <laughs> so I'd flex and they'd do it again. <laughs> China. I'm a lucky man. I've been over there twice on Aaron Lynch expeditions. Fantastic. It's like being Jim White and exploring Carlsbad Caverns over and over again. It's amazing what they're doing over there. Chongqing. Never even heard of it, but it's a city with 25 million people. This is a picture of a painting I passed on the city streets. That's the Yangtze right there. This is where rivers come together to form the Yangtze River. And uh, the caving is just fabulous in the area. With this Cave Exploration Society, who has uh, a field house in the city of Tongza, which the lo local government uh, allows them to use. And it was on that very ladder right there where I learned what a tough leader Aaron Lynch is because I dared to climb that ladder with shoes on up to the sleeping loft and you only do that once in fact don't do it at all because that's not sanitary and she runs a tight ship but the caving's fabulous and I learned some lessons about how to I thought I knew how to organize expeditions and acquire gear been doing it for years I learned they do things really well there, very organized, very professional, and still fun. Rural China's fantastic. Like I tell my friends that are non-cavers, no, I haven't been to the Great Wall, but I've been to rural China, and that's uh, like stepping back in time. Anywhere there's water, there's rice growing. The caving's great. That's my girlfriend Diana on the left, and uh, uh, Chris Denshaw on the middle, and Emily Zuber on the right, about to head underground for some days. And uh, I was dressed like them and headed into uh, San Wandong with passages like this that you walk through for hours. And sites like this. And it's a World Heritage Site uh, designated by UNESCO. And Aaron was part of that happening. And we go way back in there. And uh, camp. This is a camp I've camped in twice back in there. And somebody said, that looks like a pile of rocks to me. It is. And some people slept in hammocks. Diane and I climbed up on a ledge and slept up above. Like any of you who's camped underground, I learned long ago to keep my light right there where I know where it is. One time I woke somebody up to shine their light over where I was so I could find my light. And I don't want to do that anymore, but it's precision survey. 
uh, back sites that have to agree to within a degree. And uh, Aaron's amazing at keeping up with sketches, the high level of precision. It's an amazing caver. And since it is a World Heritage site, uh, that's taken very seriously and everybody stays in the same set of footprints on the way in and then plenty of flagging tapes been put down to designate the path on the way out. And that's throughout all the caves. We did go to a place with ancient footprints. It's still not known how long ago this person was there, uh, but whoever it was was in there with his or her dog. So I think the name of that passage is A Man and His Dog. Uh, long ago, barefoot, we don't know what kind of lights we, th that he or she used because we looked for uh, torch fragments that could maybe be dated and we didn't ha find any. So maybe an oil lamp of some kind. Um, disgusting historic cave archaeology I've seen. This is in the longest cave in uh, Oklahoma, uh, Duncan Field Cave. And uh, most of the entrances, I don't remember, I think there's six entrances to that cave, six or seven. Uh, one is owned by a survivalist that's ready for uh, civilization to fail. And the uh, problem he's got is he's moved to Arizona and I live closer than he does to his stash. So I've told people, uh, it's my stash if uh, civilization falls apart. I gave a program once where there was a little boy in the front row and when I said that about this picture he leaned to his dad and said, Dad would that man do that? And his dad said, Son, I'd do that. <laughs> this is a secret cave of mine. I'm not going to tell you the name but it's uh, been a joy to explore. It's in Texas. The landowner doesn't want anything on the internet about it but uh, it's much longer than it was when we started working it. Um, it's been just a pleasure to explore. Um, it's about six miles long. There's low airspace in there, which I really like. And I gave a lightning talk last year on low airspace technique, in fact. A lot of I've learned there. Back to Hamilton Valley, there's Bob Osborne uh, telling people uh, what's going to happen that weekend. And it's just really nice to go to Hamilton Valley and plug in with caving in the world's longest cave. I still love going there. and. Like I said before, planning to go there soon. The Wallet Project, Tommy Shiflett and I have uh, restarted that with the objective of having 10 expeditions 10 years in a row, and we got two of those behind us. In both years, last year and this year, we've had unexpected major discoveries and had groups of very good cavers from this year. Um, this is Victor Ursu from Romania. That's Andy, I um, oh, can't think of his Chapman, Chapman from Great Britain, who's been in Krubera, the deepest cave in the world. And uh, you'll see familiar faces. Gary Knapper here was with us this year, who uh, went to Watley even in the 60s, and he's come back now. Mark uh, Minton, Yvonne Drums, Zeb Lilly, who's here at the convention, Tommy Shifflett over here, Jim Smith, and uh, Don Broussard here. Don and I and Jim Smith are members of the Explorers Club and um, carried the flag in that expedition. Everybody wasn't there at the same time, so we took a couple of different group shots. So Dave Bennell was in that shot there in the foreground. He took this shot, in fact. And we uh, worked the San Agustin entrance this year, uh, rigged the cave 700 meters deep, got some real good photographers into Anthodite Hall, and Chris Higgins from Knoxville, Tennessee, took this fabulous shot, which I hope he entered in the salon and will be seen tonight, because it's, in my opinion, the best one yet surpassing maybe Jim Smith's 21 flash shot that was taken back in the 80s. Uh, I like writing about caving. It's a hobby of mine. I like getting stuff published. I had a cover story in the Explorers Club Journal. You can see my name there above Neil deGrasse Tyson's. Um, he's okay with that. He's done all right. Um, but that was nice. Let's see here. What happened? Okay. And I was awarded a citation of merit by the Explorers Club in March of this year in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History with about 1,500 people in the room. I got to go up to the podium and speak and I was only given two minutes because they said, well, Neil deGrasse only got 10. And uh, there was six minutes devoted to the award I got, two minutes of introduction, two minutes of video, and two minutes to say something. So I thought, you know, if I got two minutes, I want to have some sort of impact with it. So I carefully chose the words I was going to say and Here's the room it was in. Buzz Aldrin was in the room. Um, you can imagine some of the others. Um, uh, Sylvia Earle, for instance, met her there, and on and on. And um, 
The New York Times, I'm proud to say, grabbed on to a couple of things that I said, and that's something I said, the title of the article in the International New York Times, and then the last word was right there. It's the purest form of expiration. You don't know until you go. So I had a little fun, you know, with those that have climbed Everest for the umpteenth time and so on. And those that just send robots on down there, you know. Just, just, just all in good fun. Uh, I retired from the Boy Scouts of America last September. I got a new gig, and that is I signed up with the Speakers Bureau, the World Explorers Bureau, and uh, call myself a keynote speaker. And so far, the only jobs I've gotten as a keynote speaker are on big cruise ships. <laughs> and both in the Mediterranean Sea. So Diana and I have been flown to Barcelona once last October and, and uh, to uh, Rome recently last month and have seen uh, a lot of the Mediterranean, the ports there now. And uh, it's taxing in that in two weeks on the water, I got to speak five times. But like somebody said, I'd probably be talking about Caven anyway. <laughs> Michael Boone, I talked about him before. This is the two of us back in 77, kind of facing off. And if you read my book, You'll Achieve, I think you'll see that there was eye-to-eye -eye competition, maybe, at least uh, you know, rivalry there in terms of cave exploration. I really admire his skills, learned from him. He saved my life. I went and spoke at his memorial in May, and I'm glad this picture exists. Um, this is the, the Friday night in Jasper, Alberta. Uh, you can see Blake Harrison in the room there in the photo with me, across from him. And uh, this was Mike Boone's favorite bar. We all got drunk, and we told all the stories about Boone we could think of. Great fun. I've met a lot of really interesting people. There I am with two of the most interesting people I've met in caving. And it's been a wonderful life and I wouldn't have done anything different. Thank you to the photographers that I have borrowed from. Any questions? What's that? Well, um, Sistema Watla, we have a project, Proyecto Espiritualico Sistema Watla. For years, we called our project in Mexico the Watla Project in English. Now we're working a lot harder to get Mexican scientists with us, at least Mexican cavers. Tommy Shiflett and I are co directors of of this new project, PESH is the acronym, and uh, we name the, we, we, we reserve for ourselves the uh, opportunity to name the Rookie of the Year on an expedition. This year it was a young guy from Mexico City who just impressed the heck out of us. That he worked for a year to get in tip-top shape, he went 700 meters deep, carried three heavy bags out. Because in, in case you don't know this, exploring deep caves comes down to a lot of rope work carrying heavy bags and rappelling down with them in so bad. It's climbing back out with them that you understand what gravity means. So there's that. There's this Honey Creek project that's going on. I want to go back to China. Uh, while that's happening, I sure want to go back. I uh, went, went to Cuba with uh, Will White and Bet and others uh, that are in the room last, um, last December, planning to go back again, take my daughter with me she might want to do a PhD on cave archaeology in, uh, in Cuba, we'll see. But uh, that was a fabulous trip. If it's not full yet, you ought to jump on that and go. Because it's just a great way to see Cuba before Cuba changes much. So i got things coming up. Thanks for asking. Okay, it's a pleasure. <laughs>